All right, so um, I guess we will get started. Our topic for today was going to be scoliosis. So what we like to do is kind of a, I'll start us off and then we can have a roundtable discussion about it. If you guys have input, feedback, questions, we'll try and answer them among ourselves. And um, it may be a topic that we stick with for more than just one session if it's interesting um, to everybody. But Allison has uh, suggested the topic this time around because she has a uh, student who is has severe scoliosis and she was wondering more about that and how to best help that person. So that's how we came up with this topic for this week. So I thought, you know, I thought I would start us off just talking, making sure people understand what scoliosis is, um, why it happens, a little bit and then talk about kind of the different approaches to scoliosis to care for scoliosis. So um, I have a whole lecture developed on it that I won't have time to go over <laughs> in here, but we we are going to be discussing that again as part of our rehab course that we do. But just to I thought today we could go over some ideas, some thoughts once we get like a basic understanding of what what we're talking about. So for scoliosis, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that can fall under the realm of scoliosis. One of them is even kyphoscoliosis, which is sort of more commonly known as just kyphosis, which is that forward head rounding upper back posturing that can happen. Um, we also, so that one I think we're more comfortable with. We see it more often, something that we deal with. We were talking about um, osteoporosis the last couple of weeks in my rehab course. It's something that we come across and know how to deal with. The scoliosis that Allison's asking about is, you know, this, the C-curve and the S-curve scoliosis. So typically people are not born with scoliosis. It develops during adolescence most commonly, but can also have an adult onset as well. So it's mostly um, called an idiopathic scoliosis. Typically we don't know why it occurs in some people and not in others. And usually it's a deformation of the bone, bony structure that causes the curving in the spine. So we can have just a C-curve, one-way one curve, um, and then usually, uh, and we can have an S-curve. An S-curve often self-corrects mostly in the spine, so there'll be a thoracic curve in one direction and a lumbar curve in another direction. <clears throat> and then the C-curve sometimes doesn't correct itself within the spine, but may correct itself in the pelvis, so you might see more shifting. You, you often see a pelvic shifting happening with the scoliosis as well. So we're talking about the lateral types of scoliosis is really where I think Allison was going and she was kind enough to send me even an x-ray of her client's spine so that I could see the amount of curvature that she has. Um, treatment for scoliosis vary as well and there's a lot of, there's a different schools of thought on how to treat scoliosis. Most of them have the same goals in mind. They just have different ways of getting to those goals. So we'll talk about those. But medically also, there if there's a certain, too much curvature in the spine during adolescence, they will have, uh, sometimes the surgery now is to put rods in the spine to hold the spine straight. So if there's too much curvature and it's going to impact the internal organs and the internal organ development, they will if they catch it in adolescence, they will often put rods in the spine to straighten out the spine. So that, that creates a host of different issues as well because there's no very limited mobility in the spine then. And I don't know if you've ever seen clients that have the rods in the spine. I've had a couple of them over the years, um, really high functioning most of the time. So some, one of them was in still a lot of pain. One of them was doing all kinds of things, uh, stunt, actually it was a stunt person as well for mostly for horseback riding. So, you know, you can have a big range of abilities. The scoliosis, when it starts, if it starts in adolescence and they catch it, they'll often watch it. It accelerates usually while the children are growing. Um, but then once they hit puberty, it usually does not progress much more after puberty. And they look at bone growth um, and growth at the pelvis to see how much more growth a, a child or teen might have. And that also helps them determine what the treatment should be for that person. 
So in general terms, if you have uh, somebody come in with a scoliosis, we, because scoliosis is really a structural deformity, you cannot change what's happening at the bones with Pilates or with physical therapy or with any sort of movement therapy. You can't change what's happening at the bones, but what you can do is change what's happening in the muscles. And so the focus should be, and then hope, the hope is that we slow down the curvature of the spine. It's not that we are gonna be able to restore the spine to complete straight body. Um, and now I, ha I have a client, she's in her 50s and she has severe scoliosis, but she's maintained flexibility and balance. She's been a yoga practitioner for many years before I started seeing her. Uh, and then she also does a lot, has always done a lot of body work and she became a yoga instructor because that was so helpful to her, but not really to teach, but more for her own practice. And then she started coming to see me to just mitigate pain, back pain, um, mostly, and knee pain, actually, that she has. But that's why, so now I've been working with her probably, I want to say five years, or maybe a little bit more. And just for maintenance, I see her... Um, not even every week. I just see her when she gets a little bit out of whack, when her pelvis gets too rotated, and then she maintains on her own most of the rest of the time. And the things that you can really work on with um, people who have scoliosis are alignment and posture. So it's really not out of the realm of Pilates instructors. So it really is uh, right up our alley because we're always trying to work on posture and alignment. And so that is actually what you're going to be doing most of the time, no matter how severe the curve is. And that's where we sort of get into the how do you do that piece of it. So I'll present the two and then maybe we can start discussing things that you've done with people with scoliosis or your experiences. But uh, so one school um, believes that there should be no flexion in any of the activities. That's the Schroth School. They really believe you should have no flexion-based activities at all, and that you really shouldn't uh, wedge the body to be, make it level. So no flexion, because if you, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody be tested for scoliosis, but the, the primary test for scoliosis is this one where you put the hands together in front and you bend forward. So flexion actually really shows as the scoliotic curve very well. And a lot of times people actually have this rib hump because the spine is curving one way. And so you'll actually see that inequality as the person bends forward. So why we test it that way is because that is the way, when you're in flexion is when the curve is most accentuated. And according to the Schroth method, they really believe that putting somebody in a flex position is only accentuating the curve. So you don't wanna be working them in flexion. Other people think that you should move through all ranges of motion of the spine. And I think I come somewhere in the middle of both. So I, while that's being said, I think it's great to have all range of motion. I think a flexible spine is really key for somebody with scoliosis as, who's not had rods in, obviously, but to keeping that flexibility because the flexibility of the spine relates to flexibility of the muscles. So, um, and some people, so that, there's that idea that flexion should be part of it, but maybe not the most of it. And then there's also the idea that sometimes, well, the Schroth doesn't believe in wedging or supporting because they want the body to fall into the right alignment, right, and work for the right alignment. Whereas other people feel like if you can't get them in the right alignment and you want them in a certain position, you should support that alignment to make them as even as possible. But then, then it is, if, we're, if somebody sits and one hip is up and the other one's down and you support the hip that's down and bring it up, are you just emphasizing the curve that they already have or not? So you'll have to determine, there's a lot of things to, de to, uh, to figure out on your own what's best based on your goals, I think is what's gonna happen. And the more you study scoliosis, the more comfortable I think you will be with those things. So that was a lot of information. Do you guys have any questions so far <laughs> that you wanna ask or ideas that you wanna share? No? Okay. So what do I do when I get somebody in who has scoliosis? I will do a postural evaluation first, right? So 
have them stand up, do your regular, I hope that most of you do a postural evaluation when you first see a client for the first time, whether or not it's your first time or not, but you would take a look at them in standing and look at their inequalities. One of the best ways to see that inequality is the arm window. So if they're standing, um, you could have them stand and take a look when they're standing is in their arms relaxed, is one side arm window bigger than the other side or do they look even? That's a great way to see right away if somebody has some sort of inequality. So scoliosis ranges, right? It could be super mild and really hard to detect by the eye or it could be really severe. So the one Allison sent me, the x-ray was quite severe. Um, so I'm sure she would have uh, arm window inequality right away. So I'm gonna mimic, I can't, you can't mimic scoliosis, I'm gonna pretend, I'm gonna side bend and show you. So here you could definitely see that there would be an inequality if my posture was like this. And this arm window would be bigger than this one, which would be tucked at my side. So those are things you wanna look at. I always look front and back at somebody with scoliosis just to see what their posture looks like on both sides. You can definitely, I definitely have them bend forward just because it makes it, if you see where that rib hump is, it also gives you a lot of information as to where their inequalities are, right? Um, and then I often watch them walk as well, just back and forth to see if it's affecting their gait at all. So if, if their pelvis is really off because of the scoliosis, then their gait is also gonna be off. They'll be presenting with one leg seemingly longer than the other. So that's all, all things that you wanna take a look at and see. And then I think the main job that I would say for a Pilates instructor working with somebody with scoliosis is to try and help them find a center or a balance. So um, what exercises do I work on? I work on everything that's in neutral, just as you would normally. So all the mat work, the breathing, coccyx curl bridging, all the ab work, they need that ab work. You could decide if you felt like head up was appropriate or head down was appropriate, just keeping everything head down would be appropriate. Um, and then quadruped is a great place to work. So when you start getting into places where you can see where their spine is, like quadruped, like sitting, that's where I use a lot of hands to help guide them into as much of a neutral as I can get. And I think it's okay to be hands-on and trying different things with people who have curves in their spine to see how aligned you can get them. Because you won't know how flexible they are until you try having them do different things. So like going on to all fours is a great place to be because here they're supported and they're neutral. So this is very much like the spine position that they'll have in standing. And if you see something like a curving here or an un unevenness here, you can say, what happens if we pull that hip long? And how about pulling that shoulder down? Right, so you can think about and see where you can take them, just have them try different things and see where they are flexible, where they're not, and help them find as close to a neutral as possible. So that's one great thing. I can spend all my 15 minutes on that position with them, just working through. And while you're working through, what you're doing is you're giving them some feedback as, to help them find where their spine is straightest. And then also telling those muscles, so it's kind of like a little neuromuscular feedback, telling those muscles where to go. So you could do it in quadruped. You could also do a lot, I do a lot in prone work and with extension, spinal extension. So I use the Cadillac a lot, and I do um, swans and pec lat stretch. I'm lengthening a lot, and then swanning up, and even swanning with hands on one side of the bar to try and get, usually only one side of the spine wants to activate and overwork because it's just easier access. Um, and because of the way the curve is going, those muscles tend to get overdeveloped on one side. But if you have them swan with the hands on, on the opposite side, a lot of times you can get the side that's not firing as much to start firing and try and help find them balance that way. So moving hands to one side, and you can try both sides and see what happens. I, the, the great thing about scoliosis is a lot of times they're not in a lot of pain. And so if you go to the side that emphasizes their curve, you'll see that it's not the right way, and then you can have them go to the other side. And I usually say in the Pilates world, that your job is to work both sides of the body. You just might choose to cue 
each side differently because you're looking for alignment, right? So you might move somebody's hands to one side and see what's happening and try to cue them into their back. That's not, you know, both sides of their back and then move their hands to the other side and might cue them differently because of what you're seeing, but you're still doing the exercise on both sides because for us as Pilates instructors, it's not your, your job to um, be assessing and diagnosing. It's more your job just to keep them moving, right? So you want to get them moving and aligned and flexible. So side bending is another great thing to do. Even seated side bending. Here it's interesting because what you'll see, so I should say that in scoliosis, there's a side bend. We see the side bend really easily on x-rays in, in visually. But what you don't see that's also there as well is the rotational component. So every scoliosis also has a rotational component to it. Every side bend has a rotational component. And sometimes it's one way, but it can be the other way. So it could be an opposite rotation. But what, if you watch somebody move, you'll see where their limitations are and what happens to their body. So you'll, if you have somebody, I'm going to sort of mimic a little curve. If I am bent this way already in my spine, and then I go to side bend this way, this is easy. But if I then go to side bend this way, I'm going to have a lot harder time. Right? So you'll be able to see where my imbalances are, um, and you can help work to fix those imbalances. So I, because of watching people with scoliosis, my side bend, you know, I used to do seated side bend and not pay attention very much to what this bottom hand is doing. But now I always have people seat, with seated side bend pressing down to lengthen the side that they're going towards and then reaching up and really focusing on lengthening both sides of the spine so that if it's really easy for me to collapse on the side because I tend to have a curve that way, I don't end up here. Yes, I am still getting a stretch here, but all I've done is closed down and moved into my usual curve. But if I have to press down and reach up, now I have to try and maintain length here while I go over, right? That gives me a whole different length on that side. So I'm not just going into the same pattern that I'm always in. Same thing if, if I was going to my side bent side already, I don't just want to go there. I want to lengthen that side, right? And then keep lengthening it. And maybe I just have them reach up and not so much over on that side because I'm trying to get them to collect to the middle and align. Does that make sense? So, so what I guess I'm trying to tell you is you have all the tools to work with somebody with scoliosis, you just need to start watching what you're seeing. And then you'll, your goal is to try and keep them as aligned as possible. Um, the other, I'll say one more thing and then I'm gonna ask you guys to contribute some. If you compare a teen with scoliosis and an adult with scoliosis, it is a little bit different picture. What I've found, and I don't know if that's, I have a slanted view or not, I'm not sure, but a lot of my teens with scoliosis are just very unaware and imbalanced. And they don't have a lot of control is what I find in their center. So finding that control and stability while they're young, if you get that opportunity, that's a fantastic time to work with them because they're still so supple. And even if they're having, their bones are changing um, and you know slanting to create that scoliosis, there's so much plasticity in their body that if you can work with them, then I feel like we can have a really strong impact on their success. And your work with them should be about lengthening, aligning, and then uh, working from there in the best alignment possible all the way along. And so that is a great opportunity. With an adult, they're a little more fixed. So you're probably not going to see as good of results. But even with my 50-year-old that I was talking about, the severe scoliosis that I have currently, when she walks in and when she leaves, she's, she's a different person because we've lengthened everything and brought everything in line together. Um, and when she walks out, it's a it's totally, totally different story for her. So the, and she is on the flexible side. So you can see those results really easily. Um, so, so yes. All right. Questions so far? No. Does anybody have experience you want to share about? people with scoliosis um well i just from you know the, i know the same people zaina knows <laughs> 
uh, for the most part. But what I found is that it feels really intimidating at first because you're like, Gee, which I'm not sure which way to work. But really watching, just watching what happens is has been so important. Um, and the one thing that we've done a lot with with people with scoliosis is the chair. So standing, and that I find that to be a really good way to watch um, what's happening with standing, uh, the standing leg lowers where you're pressing the bar down, right? Positioning your hand, their hands a little differently or their, their shoulders sometimes helps them engage one side over the other. Yeah, it can be, it seems really, it's kind of intimidating to me. So what Kim is talking about is, is great. So I come at things really functionally, I think most of the time, and that's where the standing leg lowers come in because it's a super easy place. If you have somebody standing, right, that's going to translate to standing and walking outside. A lot of times, like we said, they either have a pelvis instability or a, the, just the spine, but in either case, our work is lengthening a lot. So what we'll do, you know, the standing leg lowers on the chair, usually the handles are there. This is one of the times where I really use those handles a lot because what we'll do is if they're having trouble, I'm going to pretend this is my handle for the moment. But Because you could do this on the springboard standing. You could do it with the TheraBand standing as well. You could modify right now that we're not using um, PC, many, many people in the st studio. But um, so if I have a side bend on this side and I ask them to put their hand down and push that side upright, right? I'm pressing away, lengthening this side. That's one really nice tactic that sometimes as that leg comes up and down, if they're pushing away, they're actually creating also length here. We've also used tactics of like having them hold and side bend the upper while the lower is going, right? To get alignment going a little bit better in the spine. And I'm standing behind them the whole time, just watching what's happening and suggesting, okay, let's try taking that arm up. Okay, try pushing down with that side. Um, another one of these really simple but um, effective exercises is, um, let me grab a ring here. Is, so a lot of times, you'll, we talked about there's a bit of a C curve or there's a S curve. And you'll have to sort of know, be told, or see, or determine which curve that is. But you can also help people. So some people just look very shifted when they have a scoliosis. So you can actually work, if this was my position, I could place this against a wall or against a post. I use the, I use the Cadillac poles a lot, and I put the ring at the Cadillac pole, and I'll have them stand there, try and get weight even on both feet, and then press the ribs over and then release, right? So if they are shifted, I'll work. I use this with lumbar spine shift issues as well, but I'll have them work just to try and change the alignment and get that shift over the feet by pressing in here with this supported against the wall as well. Or you could do it down at the pelvis too. So if that hip was out that way and they were standing like that, I could have it against a pole here on this side, and then I could have them work to shift into that ring and then release and shift. So they're finding new muscles and finding ways to help their own spines align. And then one more thing that came in my head when Kim was talking is, I didn't mention this in the beginning and should have, but it's really interesting when you have somebody with scoliosis to see them in the waiting area. If, they're, if you have a waiting area and you see them before they really even start working with you and see how they are sitting, that tells you a lot of information about how much they're giving into their curve. So the woman in her 50s, the very, I'll never forget the very first time I met her. I, um, we have a little waiting room and I was downstairs in this other room I came up. We have this one chair that's kind of a round, round armed chair. And she was sitting in that chair with one leg up and one leg across and leaning on the, like this. Like that was her posture when I picked her up from the 
sitting room and she got up. I didn't know her at all yet. She got up and she stood up and we walked downstairs and I'm watching her now like a hawk. I'm like, Ooh, look at that posture. <laughs> what is going on there? And she walked down and we asked her a few questions and I said, okay, your first homework. And really, if you ignore everything else I say, you're never allowed to sit like that ever again. You're not allowed to sit in your curves. So, and my teen, it's uh, getting it through the heads of my teen who have scoliosis is, is probably the hardest thing that I have to do because they'll just, it's so easy for them to sit in their curves that they don't think about sitting up straight. But that is so important. That's so much of their day, having good posture. So if all you do with somebody with scoliosis is train them how to have good posture, you're helping them so probably more than the exercises you're giving them is fixing, helping them know where a neutral posture is and how to find it on their own and teaching them not to give in and just sit in their curved spines is really a big key because if they're sitting in that, they're emphasizing the curves. Every, for every moment they're in that curved spine posture, seated or especially seated because it's so loaded and standing, they're re-emphasizing the curves that we want them to get out of. So that's a big, big thing. All right. Any, um, any other comments or input? I'd love to. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, Allegra here. Um, so you talked in the beginning about the side bend, and I noticed from looking at the manual, especially the, the barrel is supposed to be good for scoliosis. But say like right now, you know, we're in Zoom, like Matt, like what kind of side bending exercises would you recommend? I mean, what, what think, what I come to think of is like mermaid, but then I'm like, well, I'm not sure because, you know, always in mermaid, you know, one hip is a little bit higher. Um, so just, yeah, just wanted some feedback on like, oh, like this mermaid. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So side bending on zoom. I think you can, there's a lot you can still do. I let the seated side bend, I think it's okay if the hips are even here while you're working in the side bend. And my mermaid, I really still push down and have them reach up and over. So I'm really trying to lengthen. I think, honestly, I think my take on, and I use this not just with people with scoliosis, but my take is always find the length first. Mm. Scoliosis, if you think about, if you think, I like to think about it as, right, the spine, if it's curving, it's compressing. So if we take, a, if you take a spring, I'm sorry, it's kind of not a great analogy, but if you take a spring or a, anything that is curving, right, if this is a curvy band, right, and I t if I take curve, I've got more distance in it than if I pull it straight, right? So if I pull it straight and work on getting length out of it, then I'm hoping that I'm having some effect on the curving that's occurring, right? So I'm creating length. If, and if I can't change the bony structure because they're fixed in that, then I'm going to at least be lengthening the muscles around that are starting to curve with that spine, right? So you can always think about length. And that's true even if I'm going to a side bend, right? If I'm stuck, let me think. If I'm stuck this way and I want to side bend that way, I'm not going to be able to go that way unless I can go over and that way, right? So the first step to going over is creating length. And then I can go, even if I'm only going like this, and that's as far as I can get, I've just opened up the musculature on that shortened side. Does that help? Yeah, it so, does. Yeah. So even if you're in mermaid and you're a little uneven to begin with, you yeah. can press down and work on lengthening and then go into a side bend there. Yeah. So mermaid, interestingly, mermaid on the chair is one of my favorite places to put people who have um, scoliosis because I like that press down and the leg back um, stretch over. It really feels like it helps them really open and you have the pedal there to push away from and to go with. So that's also a really nice one. But so I think mermaid seated is okay. I think um, the other thing you could use as a tool that I tell people is to use a foam roller with a pillow on top because mm. that's going to get a little bit hard. You don't really want to – and then they can work on um, side bending over this way. So you can open up um, into side bending over, and you can move that 
to wherever is uh, opposing that curve, right? So you could do that as well, since we don't have the barrel or may maybe they don't have an arc or anything at home. So you could definitely use the roller um, gently. I say cover it with something softer or pillow because it can be pretty intense. So you maybe do that and then you have something for them to bend over, which sometimes is really helpful. Okay, yeah, but, that sounds mm -hmm. great. But then again, and, and it's harder to see what they're doing, but if, there's, if they're a body aware, right, cueing length and just holding and cueing length out one side, asking them to feel where they are and really cueing long body um, is, is great. So I was just going to mention one more thing um, about the side bending because uh, we talked about uh, S curves and how there's, um, you know, they'll kind of balance them, themselves out a little bit, but, um, and how you can kind of tailor your, your side bends that you're having them do based on which side they're on and where those curves are so that, you know, if, if their curve is here, um, you know, where they're kind of this way, then you would target the thoracic a little more going to the left and the lower a little more going to the right. Um, and so finding ways to either prop or encourage the length in those opposing areas um, is just something to think about. And that brings up the issue of propping. So um, sometimes I use propping and I would say that the majority of the time that I'm using propping, it's because I want them in a position that I don't have enough hands to help them get into. So one of the places that I find I use a lot of propping, I put them a lot of times on the arc uh, over the reformer. Um, and I'll sometimes they won't fit on the arc because that one side will be so bent that they won't be able to get the length of the arc on their body and I want to try and pull them out of that. So sometimes propping uh, with a little towel roll under the hip, for example, can help them pull that curve a little bit longer so that they fit in the curve that we want them to fit on. So it's all about um, trying to get a more even curve or trying to get a straighter line, trying to fix the posture. But I don't often prop, like what Genevieve was saying, to prop for assisting with accessing side bend to one side or the other, then I would use it, but I wouldn't use it as I'm gonna prop them in sitting and do a whole arm sequence. For example, like uh, seated on a long box and I wanna do arm work, I don't feel like I want to prop them there because then I'm just propping them in their curve. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So if, if um, I wanted to do any sort of arm work kind of with the TheraBand or whatever, since I have the TheraBand, and my sitting posture was so that I'm heavier on this hip and because I'm a little bent this way, and I want to do all this arm work, I don't want to, and this hip's not as heavy, I don't actually want to prop this hip to make both bones hit. I'd rather work, have them keep working on trying to lower that and then have them work for it, then I would prop that up and keep them in their curve. Unless there was pain or something and you just really, like maybe they're coming to see you because they have a shoulder injury and they're having too much pain trying to sit because they can't sit right when they're trying to do the exercises. If it's something you don't want to address, maybe then you would, but if they're in there for you to help them get into a better alignment in general, which is mostly what we do, then I would make them work for that weight through the right hip. And I'd keep cueing it. I know you're working your arms, but I want you to make that right hip heavier. Get that hip down. Don't let it sneak up on you. And as they concentrate, they'll start rolling up. Okay, get it back down. And maybe what I do is put my hand in the hip and help them hold it down and then help them lift off of it because I'm working for better alignment, right? Yeah. I have a question. Um, I work with a lot of people that are injured, um, you know, for some reason, that's just been my thing. But um, anyway, I have this one woman who's very flexible. And so she can do all those side bends and twist, you know, better than the average person. But one side always leads a lot more than the other. 
you know, she can twist on one side more. So I've been kind of cueing her not to go as far, let's say to the right as to the left, just to even it out. And I'm not, you know, I haven't read that anywhere. It's just kind of like what I came up with. I'm not sure if that's the, like what you would do or some of the other teachers would do. That's a great question. Yeah. And I think we have a lot of people who it's so easy to go one way and so not easy to go the other way. I, I think your instinct is right, right? You're trying to even things out. And that's, and that's a great thing to do. That's what we do as Pilates instructors is we even things out and align things. So I think in some way, yeah, you don't need them to keep going into that rotation on the side that they can already rotate towards. Right. In fact, you're right. I, I tend to want to limit the rotation when it's easy and make them work to get more rotation on the side that's more difficult. And they may not be able to. So that's when I would cue, okay, we can't rotate. Let's get longer instead. So again, I'm coming, I keep, I know I'm repeating myself, but coming up, up longer and taller to get that rotation, keep coming up. It doesn't matter if you can't go, but keep coming taller. And that I think will really help make them work. It's not going to help them to go 10 times to the side that they like going to, to end and then not go the other way. So your, your instinct is absolutely I mean, they can go both ways, but one side's a lot more than the other. So I've been, and then the other, you know, so as far as you were talking about repeating, so I have them repeat the harder side two times more. And I've heard both ways. And so I'm not, you know, that's just kind of what I do, but I'm not sure if that's a. Yeah. I think if you looked at, at what everybody's doing and across at the research, you'll see different things. So Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a fine line you know I kind of feel like as a Pilates instructor it's asking a lot um, not that Pilates instructors aren't smart you, the, uh, but as a physical therapist it's already a lot to know what has to happen um, and I think as a Pilates instructor defined as a Pilates instructor your job is alignment and balance so that's why I encourage people do both sides I think also if you do both sides you see what's happening. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You focus on, you think, okay, it's got to be this, they can't go that way, let's work this way. You don't see what happens when they go the other way because you might be surprised at what you're seeing and there is a lot of correcting to do even on the side. A lot of times they'll just grind down into a rotation instead of being able to stay lifted in a rotation, even on the easy side. Mm -hmm. So I think working both sides is key. I do it with, as a physical therapist, but then I will stay like if you notice that they are having a hard time going to one side then I do stay and you repeating it on the other side more than than the one side is actually that's how we could potentially rehab or look for muscular balance especially if it's in strength work you're going to maybe move um, to more muscular balance or actually even in stretching too is you're trying to find muscular balance so likely if somebody had a weaker leg than the other we would have them maybe do another set of 10 on the weaker leg than the stronger leg, or at least separate the legs so they could work the weaker one without the stronger one kicking in. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think you could argue both ways, but I would suggest that, and I suggest this even as a physical therapist, that you look at the motion in, on both sides every time, at least look at it and see what's happening so that you then can say, oh, I get this. And then what it is is learning how to break down the exercises enough that you feel comfortable with weight. I only want you to do the first 10% of side bend because that's actually targeting where you need to stretch. Mm -hmm. right? because as soon as we go beyond that, you feel nothing and we're not actually not getting to your goal. You're just collapsing or, you know, so I, I highly recommend looking at both sides. And then if you feel like, yeah, we really need to repeat the side or we need to stretch longer on this side. I think that's absolutely fine. Yeah. So I think you have really good instinct for that. Well, I've studied sports medicine a little bit too. So I'm kind of combining the two, you know. Yeah. And years of experience watching bodies. I mean, you guys know a lot from watching people move all the time. You know what's wrong, right? Sometimes, sometimes I even, I tell myself, well, I know what I'm seeing is wrong but I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to get this particular person out of that. And so I'll play, play, I'll play with their body and have them try different things until I get the result that I want. 
And I think that is absolutely fine. Like, say, for example, you put somebody with scoliosis laying prone on the long box to do arm work. That's a great place, actually, to put them. Even to take it apart and have them just hold on to the sides of the reformer, for example, and just try and do a little shoulder shrug or lat activation there. That is, like, incredible amount of information you will gather from somebody who has scoliosis. Because, one, you put them in prone. So you've stretched out their spine um, and their, their belly is flat and you've stretched out their spine. So you see, not only do you see the up down of the curve, you see the this way of the curve while they're laying there. So even just laying there, if you then connect lats a little bit, somehow ropes or side of the reformer, then you see where their activation pattern is. And most of the time they'll go right into their curve. And that's a great place to say, okay, wait, what if we activate this lat? What does that do? So it's a great place to spend time working on activation patterns. And granted, not everybody who walks in your door is going to be that patient where they want to work on the minuscule. So I try and do some big motions, like get comfortable with some motion um, and have them do it like footwork or something simple to get them going. Maybe the ab work you rush, you go rush through, you go through at a good pace, but then spend some time just like, let's see what happens when we try and get your lats on or put you prone or when you're, you know, in those positions where then you can nitpick and then you can say, okay, try activate. Nope. That didn't do it. Try reaching your leg long. Ah, now reach your leg long. Now activate. Okay. We're getting somewhere. Try pulling up your belly on this side. See if you can get them to level out a little bit by just trying different things. And I think that it's really safe when there's small motions and you'll see what you can get and they'll tell you, oh my gosh, this is so hard. And all they're doing is holding, but they'll be sweating more than when they were doing the bigger motions if they're with you on, on that work. Um, I have another question about, um, I guess, people who you mentioned um, either have rods or um, I remember a few years ago, uh, I was, teaching ballet and I had a student who came in who had just been diagnosed with scoliosis and she had been given one of those back braces to wear. Yeah. Um, do you have the move in the back brace and, and, you know, try and strengthen with that prop or I guess, how does that work? Do you have them strengthened with the brace on? Is that what the question is? Or yeah. Yeah. Or is it or is it sort of working as a prop and and making them not form I guess hold them hold themselves up? Yeah, that's a great question. So the people that you're gonna see with a brace are gonna be typically your adolescents. Um now, if the, the great thing, and they are going to have different instructions about what they're supposed to do with their brace or not. Mm -hmm. However, I think in the Pilates session and in the ballet session, um, session, I would take the brace off. And the, but take the brace off knowing that it's your job then to cue them to maintain the position that the brace put them in. Right, So you can't take the brace off and have them totally collapse on you and everything they're doing. You can take the brace off and say, whoop, but that's not where you're supposed to be holding. Right, And you can really help strengthen them and stretch them and open them into the position. But if the brace comes off and they just totally collapse, then I'd probably start with, okay, keep the brace on. Let's work through so that your body understands. We need to give some information to the body sometimes. We call it neuromuscular re-education, right? We need to re-educate the body sometimes. If the body's been put into a new position, sometimes it has no idea where to go. And sometimes it's unattainable for somebody to think about it and put their body in that place. So if that's the case, I would keep the brace on maybe the first few sessions that they do with you. And then I would start working without the brace. Once their body and mind connect and start to understand that they need to be in a different place, um, then I think you could work with them with the brace off. Um, now, if it's a big group class setting, like a big ballet class, maybe you won't have the eyes to help them enough, but they should be, like ballet is a great exercise for somebody with scoliosis, in all honesty, um, as well as Pilates. But I, I think that of all dance, that is the one I would think is the best because it's about lengthening and posturing. Um, so those two places where I would say definitely take it off. If they ask you when I go play soccer, should I take my brace off? The answer would be absolutely not, right? So, cause they're not gonna be thinking about where their trunk is. 
but in situations where they are, um, I would say take it off if you can and help them maintain the position the brace is putting them in. Anything else? Allison, how are you feeling about um, your specific client or do you have questions about other things that you could do or not to do or? Actually, I'm feeling a lot better. I, um, it's actually one of the things I really like about this round table because um, a lot of times you're just sort of on your own and you're thinking, I hope I'm doing <laughs> right by my client, but I don't have anyone to bounce this off of. Um, my, my biggest issue with this client is just knowing that what I'm doing with her is right because she's in a lot of pain. So she's mm -hmm. in her late seventies. She's walking with a cane. She has, you know, trouble with her balance and just walking, you know, is hard for her. So there's not a lot. I have to be careful doing anything with standing with her. Um, we do a lot in prone and a lot supine. Um, and because she's a lot of the side bending actually causes her pain. I've been thinking, oh, I'm hurting her. I'm making it worse somehow. So this has been a really good. Um, it, good to hear from everyone else that this, that what I'm doing with her is actually correct. And unfortunately, she's just in pain all the time and um, that I'm not making things worse. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think given your description about her pain, mm -hmm. I think if you focus on the lengthening of her spine, that's really your best bet. I wouldn't even necessarily bother with so much side bending in her case. I would, like the prone is excellent. Supine and do things that unload her spine. So she may be so compressed at this point that there's just too much load. So things that lengthen like the knees over the bar series where they're on the springboard or on the Cadillac tower where they're taking, the springboard takes weight off or the feet in the trapeze. You guys all who've worked with me know that I go back to these, all, all my back pain people, right? But it's basically the same thing, creating length and space. Maybe even teaching coccyx curl with more lengthening. Like your goal is to separate those vertebrae, give her space in that spine. So side bending, gent I would do very small side bending, incremental, um, just to open up one side and then to open up the other side. You know, things like that that are just small but really goal, the goal of creating more length and space in her body. Um, and a lot of times, if they're really bent, it'll be hard for them to push down on one side because one arm doesn't really reach. But you can actually put a moon box or a block and have them press that down. Even having her sit and push down on two blocks will probably help her feel better in getting more length. And then you can kind of cue with your hands, okay, push up more here or up more here. Um, to help her in that as well. So yeah, if somebody's in a lot of pain, I go to lengthening and soothing, separating, um, and then and then gradually into some side bending work and stretching. And and go ahead, sorry. I saw her X-ray too, and saw that you know that let the rib was down in the pelvis. It really kind of scared me as mm -hmm. well. Like oh, I'm you know if I have her side bend, I could break a rib or something. So. That's yeah. why I'm uh, glad that we had this talk today. Anything else you guys have? Or... You were talking about the spine, and that's kind of what I focus on, too, but a lot of people, and you did mention that they have hip issues. So do you um, also work with that, or, like, do you primary work with spine, and once you're satisfied, I mean, like, I'm not, I guess I'm not, I kind of try to do both, but I'm not sure what the right thing is to do. Another really good question. So uh, I see the pelvis. Um, I think our structure, if you look at a skeleton, our structure is kind of odd, our bony structure, right? So we have this big bowl of a pelvis hanging off a dangly little spine, right? So if you think of it that way, I see this big, this long skinny spine and then this big bowl that's being held together by this triangle at the base of our spine, the sacrum, right? So it's kind of an odd thing, <laughs> I think. If it weren't for all the fascia that we have, like that would just be impossible to dangle that evenly over the spine, right? But the pelvis and the spine are so interrelated. And if you, like Allison was talking about the, pel the rib being in the pelvis, but it's actually, they're actually not that far away. So even with people with kyphoscoliosis, this is a really important part, uh, a feature 
and somebody in her 70s who Allison Klein's in her 70s, there's probably some kyphoscoliosis also going on with that spine that's making that happen so that she's really in that space there. So the question coming back to the question is, do we work on what, what's going on with that pelvic alignment as well? Actually, I do. And you can, like with Allison's client, for example, even just laying her on her back and working on lengthening her pelvis evenly on both sides. Uh, she, so one of my favorites, I actually used this this morning because I was teaching an all bridging, almost all bridging class, but pressing, even being here and just pressing away and trying to get that press to be even. So somebody with a scoliosis could have a hip hike or mm -hmm. they could have a forward, right. like uh, they are not weighting one side. I can't, I can't really mimic that. But so in both cases, I would help them find that and then find that even pressure length away so that you can try and help them find sort of a neutral pelvis position that is um, satisfactory, right? So um, I think you can't fully correct this, but we're not gonna fully correct in scoliosis anyway, but in general, you can't fully correct the spine without also correcting the pelvis. So if you work for alignment at both, I think what I would do is pick my battle. Um, <laughs> you only have a short period of time, so you could work on both, a little bit on both, like getting that pelvis as level as possible, and then getting the spine as level as possible. That would be ideal. But know that if there's a curve in the spine that's not compensated in the spine itself, it's going to compensate in the pelvis somewhere because their feet have to hit the ground. Both feet have to hit the ground. And so we're going to find a way to hit both feet to the ground. If the spine is curved and not compensated within itself, then one side of the pelvis is going to be higher. And we're going to find a way to get to the ground. Does that make sense? So I think um, know that it's maybe not going to correct all the way and not maybe not even stay there, but to give them space if they're in pain is really great. To work on finding that pelvis neutral is also really great. Um, I, I go, I think I go, I think my inclination is to go for length first. I do almost always check their alignment at their pelvis just for my own information. I don't often correct it when it's somebody with scoliosis. And I think it's the Schroth method that also says you should not correct pelvic alignment when there's a scoliosis because it's, you're just loosening the pelvis and it's not going to stay because they need to right themselves. They need to get both feet to the ground. So there is some people who think you really should not be adjusting the pelvis. Do I never adjust the pelvis? That's not actually, that's not true. I depends on where their pain is and where I think the bulk of the problem is. And sometimes I feel like they go beyond their usual and then they get this also this pelvic rotation. So I'll fix that when I feel like it's there. Um, and then work from the spine upward. So I didn't really answer your question, but I think it's a choice and I think it's good to look at both and address both. Um, and I think you just have to pick which thing you think is most relevant based on pain and patient complaint. Um, but I do think length is definitely priority number one, I think. Yeah. I said, what's nice is I see this person three times a week. So, you know, my focus was like the spine initially, and then I'm, I was thinking, well, I should fix their pelvis too, because even when like legs, um, legs on, on strap, it's like she tends to go over to one side and one hip is up, um, up in terms of up towards the ceiling, not up. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I did work a little bit on it and it really didn't make a difference. It will take time. It'll take a lot of time. Yeah. And then to develop that awareness. Um, and then I would say just with feet and straps on the reformer, I don't mm -hmm. like, I don't like to do feet and straps on the reformer as much as on the springboard or tower because the, the feet and straps on the reformer is on a pulley. So one right. leg can do the work for both legs. And so it doesn't force work evenly. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're on the springboard that you f end up forcing work evenly. And then you also have the, either if you're on the Cadillac using the tower, you have the poles so I'll have them often push and pull to get their spine straight while their legs are going so that I get 
full length, like maximum length out of one side. So that also can really help if you have the arms up or one arm up. Sometimes I'll have one arm up, one arm down. I'll have one arm pushing, one arm pulling, you know, different things to help the spine align itself while the legs are working in that. And then you can kind of see the pelvis dip a little or sort of sort just a little bit more. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. If you guys want more information, there's so much information out there about scoliosis. It can be really overwhelming. I've taken like, I don't know, probably 15 different classes on scoliosis over my years, just trying to sort it all out. And I um, did this Schroth training most recently, not, not a certification. I did not go all the way. They have a huge certification program that you, one could do, but um, was really intrigued. I love the work that they're doing. Um, their rules are very fixed. I tend to be not a very fixed rule sort of a person because I try and look at the individual and that might be to my fault. I'm not sure or to my credit either way, sometimes probably a little bit of both, but um, I, it, there's some interesting, um, even on Pilates anytime, I know some of you guys are on Pilates anytime. Madeline Black has a few scoliosis workshops. Suzanne Martin also has some scoliosis workshops for Pilates instructors that are interesting. They both use propping and they don't ascribe to the Schroth method. Um, I just wanted to throw that method out there because it, you will come across it if you start delving into um, scoliosis. And there is a lot of really great things. Um, they have their own piece of equipment, which is kind of like a springboard, but with bars everywhere where they, people can push and pull and side bend and other. So um, that is something to look, to look at as well if you're interested. But I, if you want more digging, you can look at one of those or uh, we're going to have, we do have a recorded version of our scoliosis workshop and we're going to redo it with, because um, the person I had in the video didn't have a severe scoliosis. It's hard to see a lot of the adjustments we were making. So as soon as COVID allows us to take off masks around people, I was going to re-video that workshop with somebody with much more severe scoliosis just to show. Um, so, and we'll have that live virtually when we do it. So we can keep you posted on that too, just if you wanted to have another look. So yeah, that hour went by very fast. Does anybody have a idea for next session or something that they'd like to cover next session? If you aren't thinking of it now, send me an email. We'd love to have you um, love, have your input. I love, Allison, thank you so much. And again, I'm sorry I didn't respond, but yes, I did take a good look at that. and. Um, that really helped me guide what we, what I felt like I needed to talk about. So if you guys have anything or client issues or things, even simple things that you want to discuss, please send your information. We'll, I would love to include it in a topic. Awesome. All right. Well, good to see everybody. <laughs> I'll see you guys soon. <laughs>